Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Maria. I'm going to have the absolute pleasure of inter uh, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous I can't even speak, of introducing um, Dr. Christopher uh, Hendon um, to you guys. Um, I think you're in for a real treat. The very first time that I heard uh, Christopher talk was about, I'm thinking three or four years ago at a East Coast East Coast Coffee Madness in Montreal. And he had done a talk on his latest book, Water for Coffee. And um, he talked about how, um, you know, the chemical composition of water really affects the flavor of your coffee. And I just fell in love with the chemistry part of coffee. I mean, coming from a coffee growing background and later a coffee roasting background, I, I knew how important that was. At that moment, I wasn't really brewing, so I wasn't really paying much attention to how the water that some of my um, customers would have and how was that affecting. I was all concentrating on the chemistry of the bean and the chemistry of the roasting um, process. And when I heard him talk, I just loved the way he took something that was so complicated, made it seem absolutely simple. And when we were planning um, to bring the SEA qualifiers here, I just couldn't think of a better way than opening it up than with Christopher talking. So I wrote him an email with the, you know, just winging a prayer that he would find some time in his schedule to come visit us here in St. Thomas and kick this off. And when he replied about three months later, he kept me waiting for a long time. <laughs> Um, I literally danced around my uh, roastery for about a day. I just couldn't believe it. I was so excited. Um, and I'm really happy that you could make it out this morning and hear him speak because you are going to be in for a real treat. So um, I'm not going to take any more of your time. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Christopher. It's been absolutely wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that it was three months. I, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a long time, though. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, part of the reason is I started a new job. So I'm, I'm now an assistant professor of chemistry at the University of Oregon. I'm going to show you a couple of photos of, of this in a moment. Uh, this talk is, is slated for two hours, okay? So we're going to give two parts. There will be an intermission. We can walk around and that sort of thing. And it, this is a pretty unusual environment. I realize there's some seats that are better than others in this, in this room. Um, and because of that, and because of the length, I'd encourage you to actually interrupt me and ask questions when the questions come up, okay? So I, I really want this to be more interactive rather than a, one big seminar. Okay, so uh, a, few, a few bookkeeping things. Um, for those that like scientific literature, sometimes it's a little bit dry. Uh, but I, I find papers online that I find interesting and I upload them to my website illegally so that you can read them. So <laughs> if, you'd like, if you'd like to read, and at the moment they're not labeled very well, so you have to open the PDF to figure out what, it, what it's about. But if you'd like to reading about more of these things, you, I encourage you to go here. And if there's a paper that you'd like access to, email me. And three months later, evidently, I'll put it online. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> now I only have two hours. Um, and I apologize if there's topics that I don't speak about. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of work in the industry for you know, quite some time now, and there is some online presentations on topics uh, that I've detailed here that you can go and watch for free. So my, uh, I gave a talk at RICO in 2017 on cooling of coffee, freezing it, as some might think of. Um, I'd encourage you to look at that. That finally came online after a couple of years. Uh, the tamper tantrum talk, that's actually a really fun one. That was one of my first ever in the coffee industry. That's on whether when you shake an espresso basket before you tamp it, whether the fine particulates move around in the basket. And you'd, you'd think you couldn't give a whole talk on that, but that, that talk's actually awesome, so you should... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, lot, a lot of work, physicists have been interested in that problem for a very long time, so actually it was great to revisit that stuff. And then finally, um, I recently gave an American Chemical Society talk, which is actually uh, not to the coffee industry, that's to my, my other industry, which is of scientists. And so I did my very best to convey to them the things that we all do in this room day to day, like the natural process, for example. Most people have no idea what that is. And so we go through these sorts of things and explain sort of the outlying chemistry and physics that, that I was encouraging 
my colleagues to go after. So that's actually fun, that's an hour long, and that's a, that's a really good one. Now one time I gave a talk um, to the scientific community, and they said, hey, if you'd like to work on our espresso machine, you're welcome to, and they showed me their equipment, they had this, uh, this grinder here. <laughs> And so this gives you an idea of the level of the people that I interact with uh, in, the cafe, in my, in my uh, cafe setting, right, which is the, you know, at the university. I did a PhD at the University of Bath, which was found, the city itself was founded in the year three. Uh, the Romans went here because Bath, as the name would infer, at, is uh, a natural hot spring. And so, of course, this is the Roman baths. Uh, and you can imagine uh, emperors would go in there and bathe. It was thought to be therapeutic. It was supposed to be some sort of uh, health remedy. And, and indeed, actually, as we'll learn later on at the end of the water part of this talk, that it, that's probably true. Uh, I then moved to a slightly newer town, uh, Boston. Um, and I did a, PH, a postdoc, actually, at MIT. Now, MIT is not in good light at the moment, so we're not going to talk about that. But uh, after my two years at MIT, I started at the University of Oregon. Uh, University of Oregon is in Eugene, south of Seattle, north of uh, all of California. Um, and actually, we're famous because the, uh, the owner of Nike went to the University of Oregon. So we're, we're pretty much funded by Nike, uh, and so our sports teams are obviously very nice looking. Uh, the, 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 the O, this is our logo, uh, my faculty job is paid for by the royalties of the O on Nike shirts. So it's, you know, it's very integrated with the sports culture, but actually it's also the research, the premier research institution in the, uh, in the state of Oregon. So I was employed actually uh, as a theoretical chemist and I had a research group of, of many young scientists, the top four are my permanent graduate students, and they work on topics ranging from energy storage to energy uh, capture and harvesting. So in other words, light to electricity transformations, capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and these sorts of things. I also have a bunch of undergrads who are I I almost as talented uh, as the graduate students. And you know, we, that's part of the program that I run, is I want to take the people who are really motivated and give them opportunities. And so a lot of these undergrads have already published multiple scientific papers, which if you, know, if you think about what that means, that's essentially positioning them to go to any school they want for a graduate school, should they choose that. So we're doing something good there. And they've given me the uh, approval to build a coffee lab at the University of Oregon. So that's, that's coming. So soon I'll have a dedicated facility for this. But I need to tell you how the whole journey started. So in 2014, I was at the University of Bath, uh, and I went to a local cafe, Kelowna and Smalls. Now, for most people here, this, this cafe is obviously very well known. It's one of the best uh, sort of widely regarded in the, highly regarded in the world. So this is the board that we're presented with, and I honestly at the time knew nothing. But this board's pretty interesting because it's got information ranging from variety to the producing country, as well as flavor notes for a particular espresso with or without milk. And this is a dream for most cafes, right? Most cafes wish this is all they could display. There's not even prices on this menu, right? So for somebody who's coming from America, uh, this was pretty challenging. And over the years, uh, I learned to appreciate this. This is a piece of scientific information to me. And so I'd start to learn that perhaps, for example, the spice flavor note here, is that correlated with the fact that it's come from Rwanda or the fact that it's washed or is that something that's characteristic of Red Bourbon? These are things I did not know at the beginning and now we've learned to piece these this together, okay? Um, and actually, the story actually begins with a cup of coffee that was supposed to have flavor notes of lemon peel, bergamot, and watermelon, and it didn't. And so Maxwell, the, the barista that I would work with, was es essentially trying to dial this coffee in, but for whatever reason, we ended up with a cup of coffee that tasted like salmiaki dirt and Brussels sprouts. Um, so, so the salmiaki is a salted licorice from... Um, from uh, Finland, and it's worth noting that it is salted, and we'll come back to that later on as well. But the, the point is, is that sometimes you have a flavor malfunction, and it's, not, it's usually not the human's fault, and so I'm gonna try and convince you by the end of the first half of this talk that actually the human has very little to do with the problem that in this cup. The reason is, is because I think uh, approximately that the quality of a cup of coffee primarily comes from the agricultural product. If you start with high, high quality agriculture, you, you maximize your chance of success of getting a high quality cup. But let's say you start with the finest coffee in the world, somebody can roast it and completely mess it up. So of course roast contributes to this. But then the roaster is you know, quality controlling with water, and so the water chemistry is gonna make an impact as well. So I'd say water and roast are sort of intimately related, and I give them an equal weighting of about 20-20. And at the bottom, uh, the equipment, as most of you know, doesn't really matter. We cup coffee, that's how you grade the quality of it. So, perfect. 
This is the youngest person I've ever spoken to, so <laughs> we haven't even got to the hard stuff yet. <laughs> all right, I mean, I won't be the first person to cry in the room, so. The, uh, <laughs> all right, so part one. So, so when I was thinking um, last night about what to talk about for two hours, it seemed right to talk about uh, how Maria and I first met. And this is on, over water chemistry. So I'm going to give you all of first year chemistry in about an hour and 10 minutes. Okay? And so here's, uh, here's a picture of me when we first met. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty young. This is at the World Bristol Championships 2014. I haven't changed much. If you've seen Maxwell, he doesn't look like this anymore. Um, you know, and we've come a long way. Uh, since then, I've, you know, I was a graduate student at the time, and now things have changed a lot. And our understanding has changed a lot too. So even if you've heard or read Water for Coffee 1, Water for Coffee 2 is coming, and this is Water for Coffee 2, okay? So this is going to contain a lot of stuff that you haven't seen before. Now, I encourage you, every time you see a picture of one of these flowers, the process of making a flower, that's an opportunity for you to stop and ask questions. Because we're going to traverse a, a magnitude of scale here. We're starting with an atom, and we're going to end up at an application. So applications are things that you, you know, atoms are used for. So you can see that there's going to be some big knowledge gaps, and we have, to, we have to fill those in. So let's start with atoms. And this is, the beginning is about 13 billion years ago. So at this point, is there any questions? I suspect not yet. There will be. All right. <laughs> okay, the universe is made up of positively charged and negatively charged particles. There's some neutral ones in there as well, but we'll get to them in a minute. The negative ones seem to float around the outside of the positive ones, where the inside is the uh, nucleus and the outside is this cloud of electrons. And we can describe where those electrons are with some probability function. So they're typically pretty close to the nucleus. Not, they're not exactly in the same place, but you can see there's a pretty high probability of finding a positive charge next to a negative charge and vice versa. And as you move further and further away from this, you end up seeing less and less of that electron because there's no plus and minus pulling each other together anymore. And so the density of electrons tails off pretty quickly as you move far away from atoms. But actually it turns out that all atoms are somewhat attracted to each other. And so these, these uh, negative charges are attracted to this positive charge, but also other positive charges as well. And so as you move two atoms close together, progress, you know, when they're really far apart, they don't interact. But when they get closer and closer together, they start to want to stick together a little bit more. You can think of this as like an, a molecular level of gravity. It's, it's completely different force, but it's something analogous to this. It makes mass stick together. At some point, however, you're going to reach a point where it's really happy, that equilibrium bond length. And this, this equilibrium is uh, saying these two atoms are really happy at, let's say, you know, this far apart. If you push them any further together, then you've got these two, you know, big clouds of electrons going to repel. And so you get really strong forces pushing the atoms apart. And so you see this rapid increase in energy. This is high energy. And so this, this whole potential here is called a Morse potential or a Leonard Jones potential. And this describes every interaction in the entire universe, more or less. So, we have a, a plus and a minus, a proton and an electron, and if we add them together, you end up with a hydrogen atom. And if you were to somehow ram this electron into the proton, physically combine them, you end up with a neutron which has negative, uh, neutral charge. If you then add a neutron to the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, you get to something called deuterium, or heavy hydrogen. If you add a second neutron, you get to even heavier hydrogen, or tritium. Now, this is essentially the basis, this is nuclear chemistry, and this is what stars are doing. So this is, the, this is how we're generating energy, is we're essentially going to take hydrogen atoms, and as you'll soon see on this slide, combine them to form helium, overcoming that initial strong force, releasing a whole bunch of heat, and that's, that's the sun. Okay? You can keep doing these combinations where you have a couple of neutrons hanging around, maybe some hydrogen and some other nuclei, and then you add them together and you end up with something like lithium, and you can eventually fill out the whole periodic table. So, you can form elements all the way up to element number, uh, uh, to iron, at, with a mass of 60. After that, it starts costing energy to form that, uh, that particular element. And so this is a bit of a problem because it means that, you know, we get to iron, but then there's all those other elements on the periodic table, uh, and they're not formed in the, in the beginning of a star, in the normal life of a star. In fact, what they're formed in is the death of a star. So as the star starts to cool, it starts to contract, and eventually that energy causes a, a massive explosion called a nova. Now, here I, de I depict one. This is not the nova, okay? This is, this is the nova. And now that looks relatively small compared to the galaxy, but actually this is tremendously huge. Um, 
Now this is pretty neat, right? Because this means that the death of stars is what's resulting in all of the elements on the periodic table, or at least those that are heavier than iron. It's also worth noting that uh, this year is quite a big party for us as chemists because it's the 150th year of the periodic table. So uh, that chemistry parties are different to coffee parties. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the first periodic table was published by Mendeleev, uh, and, and what's really nice about this table is that it shows predictions, like, for example, there's question marks. We know that there's a, some element with a mass that, of 180, but we don't know the name of it. We don't know what it is. And so this is really nice because this is the first example of chemists starting to make predictions about matter, that, but they couldn't assign it in 1869. I actually went to Russia to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the periodic table, and it was a very strange party. So <laughs> I look forward to this afternoon, or this evening. Um, this is the periodic table as we see it now. So I told you that up to about here, we form in the, the sort of main sequence of a star, and then the star dies. And after it dies, you form all of these other elements. And that's interesting, right, because they become progressively more rare and therefore more expensive. And so platinum and gold are actually much heavier than, than iron, and indeed that's, and they're rare, and that's the, the origin of the cost. So as you move down the periodic table, typically they become more expensive. Um, there's a few other key things in this picture. So there's the atomic number, which is telling us the number of protons or positive charges in the nucleus. There's the elemental symbol. Now, these symbols uh, are not necessarily uh, indicative of the English name. So for example, tin, S-N, is stanum. These come from a variety of things, German, Latin, etc. Hydrogen's easy, it's H. The atomic mass is usually in whole integer numbers, so one, two, three, but the reason you see this 1.00794 is because I showed you before how you make deuterium, heavy hydrogen, and tritium, and they occur in some, you know, some abundance, let's say some percentage. And so this is actually the average mass. If I were to hold some uh, hydrogen, some of them would be tritium and some would be deuterium. So on average, the mass of hydrogen is 1.00794. And then of course the name. So it turns out that those heavier isotopes, the ones, that, the elements that have additional neutrons in the nucleus, actually are not always stable. So sure, carbon's stable, carbon-12, and as is carbon-13. But carbon-14 has a half-life of about 5,500 years. And this is nice because this means that a half-life is it decomposes into something else. So you're not losing you're not losing mass, it's just turning into something else, right? And so carbon is going to convert to nitrogen-14, over a, every, you know, every 5,500 years, you're going to have one gram turning into half a gram, turning into, you know, 0.25 of a gram. And so actually this is what we use to quantify how old something is, right? Is that we look at the mass of carbon-14 versus the mass of carbon, and we can carbon date something based on the isotope, uh, the isotope abundance of carbon. Something like iodine, on the other hand, well, we have iodine-127, which is stable, but you have a whole bunch of other isotopes like iodine-122 and 125, which both decompose into tellurium, isotopes of tellurium. And then you also have this one, 128, which decomposes into either xenon or tellurium. And you'll note that the half-life there is pretty quick. Who cares, except for that tellurium is extremely bad for you, okay? So actually, this is the origin of, uh, this is why people are afraid of nuclear weapons, is because what you do is you form all these nuclear reactions, and then some of them are going to form these isotopes that if they get into your body are going to mess you up. We have used, humans have used a fission bomb. Uh, this is where you take an unstable isotope like plutonium, uranium, something like this, and then it will decompose. And that's essentially, that's the, the origin of the nuclear weapon that we've seen, demonstrated on, you know, as, a, as a violent weapon. The really scary one that we've never seen is a so-called thermonuclear weapon, which is where you enrich with tritium and then you do essentially the, the chemistry that the stars do. You start to combine elements. That's really scary. We, we have these technologies and we don't want to use them, right? And so that's, that's something that we certainly hope never to use. But why, people, why I'm mentioning any of this is because actually one of the things that people are told to do when there's uh, some sort of nuclear fallout or some radiation is to ingest a lot of iodine in the form of potassium iodide. And the reason is is that your body can concentrate iodine into your thyroid, your bladder, and other areas. And if you saturate your thyroid, your bladder, and so forth with good iodide, then it won't uptake any of that radioactive iodide that decomposes into tellurium. And so indeed that is, uh, I mean, this is a... This is a radio image of people who have ingested uh, radioactive iodide, and you can see it hitting key areas in their body, and so this is obviously bad. Of course, none of this matters for coffee. If you have radioactive iodine in your coffee, you're, in, you're probably having some funky natural, right? So 
The, the point is, is that we don't need any of those elements down below. In fact, what we really need is just sort of this top row of, of elements. Hydrogen's an important one, of course, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, these are the elements of life. What's nice about this table is I've substituted, instead of uh, the atomic mass, I, I've now substituted in the electronegativity. The scale ranges from one to four, one being something that is really happy giving away a negative charge, and four being something that's extremely happy receiving it. And so you can see that the low numbers are over here on this side, and the high ones are over on this side. And this makes sense. Hydrogen, uh, or let's do lithium. Lithium likes to lose an electron, and it will lose the electron rapidly to fluoride, and so you end up with Li plus and F minus, for example. This is nice because we can start to construct various different molecules now just based on the electronic structure of the elements. For example, we know oxygen would like to obtain two electrons to get over to here. I'm sorry I didn't make that as clear as I could have. Elements always want to become like the noble gases, so they'll lose or gain electrons to get to the edge. So oxygen is two steps away, one, two. So it's going to gain two electrons to get over to here. That means oxygen typically occurs as two minus. So if oxygen is two minus, it's looking for two pluses somewhere. And the most obvious example, of course, is adding two hydrogens, which like to be plus, and you end up with water. We can get more complicated. We have calcium two plus, note that you'd lose one electron, and then the second one to back to argon. And then carbon, well, it's a bit ambiguous. You see, it's, uh, it could go from anywhere from minus four to plus four. So who knows with this guy? And then oxygen, again, two minus. Now, obviously, someone in the audience might go, well, of course, you could just have calcium and oxygen, and that, that exists, that's calcium oxide, right? But you could also have more complicated things, for example, lime scale, where you can see the charges, they all balance each other out. Okay, that's pretty good. You guys just did 13 billion years of chemistry in about uh, 22 minutes, not bad. So, let's take a moment. Does anyone have any questions at this point? No, just, well, I see one person just like, holy shit. <laughs> all right, all right, good. It, I, I assure you that all of the things that I'm talking about, actually, they really matter to understanding why water is so complicated and, and how the communication at the time in coffee was really predicated on a lack of understanding of the fundamentals, and so we've made progress. So this is worthwhile, I assure you. Okay, back to this periodic table. We are trying to now make molecules because we don't only care about the elements. And so you've seen the electronegativity is some indication of whether the molecule is going to want to lose electrons or going to gain them. But if you then were to sort of compare the electronegativity of hydrogen to that of oxygen, perhaps it doesn't fully transfer the electron from here to here. Perhaps it just shares it, but it's the electron, the negative charge hangs out more near the oxygen than the hydrogen. That would be sort of my intuition, and so indeed there is something uh, where an ionic bond is one where you've transferred that electron entirely. So sodium used to have one, and then it's passed it over to chloride. Now sodium is Na plus and chloride is Cl minus, okay? But it doesn't have to fully transfer, it could just sort of polarize and the negative and se positive separate a little bit. And so this is a polarized bond, the oxygen-hydrogen bond. And then there's something called covalent where the electronegativities are quite similar. So for example, hydrogen and carbon. And in this case, that electron or that bond that's formed is sort of equally shared between the two elements. And so this one is not that polar. This one is polar because indeed it is polarized. And then these ones are actually what we call point charges or monopoles. They are a single positive charge or a single negative charge. And this spectrum is everything in the, uh, to do with water chemistry, right? Because water is this polarized thing because it's H's and O's and everything you dissolve in it is either a salt or a molecule. So it's some spectrum in, in here. So you can see that water is going to get complicated. Okay? Not only does composition matter, but geometry also does. So in this case, uh, what we have here is for a given number of atoms, let's say we have a single atom, then the only thing that matters is its identity. Of course, is it lithium or is it carbon, right? But as we start to build out more complicated molecules, as soon as we have two atoms, atoms, you either have a choice of them being the same, and therefore it can't be polar, or different, and then maybe it's polar, right? It's possible. And then once you have three, you need to consider the bond angle between the three atoms. And then when you have four, we get to the so-called dihedral angle, which uh, for illustration purposes, what it is, is imagine I have one atom in my fist here, one in my elbow, another one in this elbow, and another one in the fist. It is if these two are in, in the same line, it's the angle between my fists. 
All right, so it does involve four points, as you can see. So that would be 90 degrees, that would be zero degrees of a dihedral. All right, so this is, this is sort of like a, one, of the, one of those um, IQ tests where you have to sort of imagine an object in 3D space. But the, the point is, is that as you build out more complicated molecules, you have a lot more considerations as to whether the molecule will be polar or not. Let me give you a couple of examples. Molecules are tremendously diverse in their shape uh, and composition. For example, 2,4,6-trichloroanisole, the compound on the top left there, is one of the compounds responsible for the wet dog smell in cork-tainted wine. Okay, so it, it contains chlorine. As we move across, eugenol is a delightful woody flavor that you get in whiskey uh, coming from oak. Typically, it's actually not valued in specialty coffee because it's the woody note that we think is kind of like sort of a baggy, stale agey thing going on. Citric acid, of course, we all are very familiar with that. Lactose, some of us don't like this, etc. And you can go all the way up to drugs like amoxicillin. This, this drug is actually... Uh, its key activity is defined by this little square right here, this lactam ring. And so, of course, organic chemistry is a rich canvas and a playground for chemists because you can essentially make any shape you want, and then its bioactivity and its, and its smell and taste and all these things all depend on the structure and composition. And so that's why there's so many people working in this because this ranges from the wine industry right here and flavor and perfume industry here all the way to the pharmaceutical industry. But hopefully you can see this is just all the same toolbox, and so we just discretize into what, what interests us. But we're interested in this guy, okay? Pretty simple looking thing, but actually it's polar, and so that means you can have a plus minus interaction. So the O, which is partially negative, can interact with the plus of hydrogen. And if you cool this down so that you let all the oxygens orientate towards all the hydrogens in, in water, and you go to a temperature of, let's say, zero degrees Celsius at one atmosphere of pressure, you might form a trimer, this little hexagon of water. And indeed, because you can see that this has three points going this way, and then if you can think of those as pseudo three other points, this is why snowflakes all have, do I have a picture? Yes, yeah, snowflakes have uh, six, six points, because on the atomic scale, water assembles in these little hexagons, okay? Um, but water also interacts with things that are solvated. So, for example, chloride, Cl- is going to want to bind to the H's because they're positive. Sodium wants to bind to the O's because sodium is positive and the O's are negative. You can pretty much summarize all the first year chemistry with that. If you can figure out where the negative charge is in something and the positive, you've got the answer, right? That, that's chemistry in a nutshell. But something that's often overlooked and poorly taught, even at university, is how water solvates things that are not polar. Something like an alkane. This is octane in this, or unoctane in this case. Now, water actually likes to form cages around these things because it can't find a place to interact with the molecule itself. And so while we typically think of petrol separating from water, right, if you were to mix them, they don't mix. They're not miscible and they separate. It's not true, actually. Water does solvate some of it to an extent. But the reason that you end up with phase separation of this stuff moving to the, floating to the top of the water is because it costs energy for water to form cages, big cages around things. And so at some point, the energy of forming the cage is offset by the energy of simply expelling that liquid entirely from solution. And so the key point here is that water is actually a great solvent at solvating things that aren't even really that soluble in water, okay? And so that's pretty much what coffee is for most of it. All the brown stuff is probably not that soluble in water, and we get a little bit of it in there. And that's really how coffee can be summarized, as a little bit of a lot of things. Similarly, we can dissolve carbon dioxide. So you can see that carbon, you'd think, is going to be positive, and the two O's would be negative. But because the two O's are pulling equal and opposite directions, this thing's technically not polar. But water can interact with the O's partially and with the C's partially, and so you can get pretty high concentrations of carbon dioxide dissolved in water. Okay, uh, so as an aside, going back to this idea of, um, of organic chemistry having a rich landscape, this right here is a triglyceride. Now, a triglyceride is uh, characterized by this little, this little thing I've highlighted in red, and what's important is if I add sodium hydroxide to this, I can cleave it up and I form these things that have sort of long tails and a polar head. Now you note that this half of the molecule here is not polarized, but this part is. And so one might think that this part would be expelled from water and this part would love water. 
right? And so actually this is the basis for how you'd make soap out of any sort of animal-based fat, is you do, you just cleave it up with sodium hydroxide. Um, but, the, but the point is you end up with a byproduct of glycerol, which is sol soluble in water, and then these things have sort of half of them are soluble and the other half is not. They find this, the oils that are not that soluble in water, and then the tails of the soap point towards the oil, and the heads of this surfactant then point outwards into the water, and you get these little things called micelles, and these are float away, and that's how you clean your dishes, right? So there's a variety, a whole industry dedicated to designing new tails, right? So a new tail would have a different preference for what you're going to be able to dissolve in the tail. And new heads. And of course, we might care about, you know, if we have another BP oil spill, you're going to care about which, which of these, my, or which of these uh, surfactants is dispersed through the ocean because you don't want it to poison animals. So we actively work in this area as well. Okay, so water is a bulk material, which means that it's not just H2O as a single molecule, but actually the properties that we observe in water are attributed entirely to a collection of water molecules. But very rarely do you find just H2O by itself, right? You always find stuff solvate in it because it's such a good solvent that as soon as I open it to air, it's going to dissolve oxygen, CO2, everything. And so water should never be thought of as a pure material. It should always be thought of as some sort of dirty, defective material, and that makes it really interesting and complicated. If you had pure water, however, there are some unusual properties of this. Uh, if you heat it, we, I mean, we all know you boil water at one atmosphere at 100 degrees Celsius, the water converts from liquid to, uh, sorry, yeah, from liquid to gas, right? It boils. If you go back the other way, that's a condensation. You're taking a gas to a, to a liquid and you form sort of beads of water. And of course, you can traverse this whole area. I guess perhaps for those less, in, uh, less familiar with this, the word sublime actually is specifically refers to the phase transformation between solid water, or any material for that matter, solids to gases. Uh, and for water, that happens to, to occur at essentially a pretty, pretty low pressure uh, and uh, relatively low temperature. So you'd have to really pull a vacuum on a piece of ice in, in order to see a sublimation. This is pretty neat. For, you don't need to worry about either of these panels too much. I mean, the whole, the, this panel is where we're working, okay? And fortunately, uh, we're only working in either one atmosphere or higher. So things be, typically behave, right? The, the higher one would be ex an example is this thing. Okay, so key take-home messages at this point is that if you have an organic molecule, which is made of carbon and other stuff, and there's a lot of oxygen on that carbon, then the oxygen is gonna be negatively charged, the carbon will be relatively positive, and as a result, you get organic molecules typically being somewhat polar. Okay, so if you drive off oxygen and nitrogen off of that molecule, then you're gonna make the molecules progressively less polar. And so life has, is essentially born around making polar molecules, and then when you roast something, you're driving off carbon dioxide, which is contains two oxygens per carbon, so you're, you're making your coffee less and less polar as you roast it more and more. So bear that in mind as we move forward. Then, it's also worth noting that on Earth, large molecules are made of carbon. So if you wanted to make a large molecule more soluble, you'd want to break it up, okay? And then finally, polar molecules dissolve in water. Let's give a couple of examples. For every plus charge, there must be a minus charge somewhere in the universe. And typically, for every plus charge in your cup of water, there's a minus charge somewhere else in that cup of water. So if I have a calcium, two plus, I'm going to need some sort of minus of equal and opposite charge to balance that out. And here's three examples, carbonate, uh, hydroxide, and chloride. And the compounds you'd form would be calcium dichloride, calcium dihydroxide, or calcium carbonate lime scale. Other th examples could be hydrogen and iodide to form hydrogen iodide. And then, of course, we could go for magnesium and bicarbonate, this compound. Now, it turns out, however, that these can balance each other out in a cup of water. But if I were to drive off all the water by boiling it completely dry, this compound does not exist. This is just a neutral compound, but you could never isolate it. So it's, it's sort of a thought ex experiment is that what can exist when it's solvated is not the same as what it exists as when you drive it off to a, a solid. And I find that that's truly fascinating. Okay, so I, you don't have a choice. Somebody's going to have to participate now. <laughs> How many Quakers are there? Anyone? We got one Quaker. Okay, that's good. Any other options? Four? Four? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the light roast problem. Okay, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There's either one or there's 
there is a really, really big difference between these, okay? Because this could be an anomalous sample where I picked out four beans, one of which was a Quaker, or it could be that every one in four beans is actually a Quaker. You know, that's a big difference. Okay, so chemists have overcome this problem. We simply count by the number that we observe. We don't make a statement about, you know, 25% of something unless we have a really large sample size. And so it's, this is best illustrated by this, uh, this picture that I've stolen from somewhere on the internet and did not reference that says... Uh, the, the weight limit or the weight capacity for an elevator. And, so the, and this always has perplexed me because uh, the idea is that this elevator is rated for nine, nine people or 1,000 kilograms, okay? Well, they, I mean, I know a lot of people that, you know, do not weigh one, you know, 110 kilograms. Um, but then they also give you all these other metrics to measure 1,000 kilograms. And so this, is actually, this actually illustrates the example I showed you before. Um, but actually what chemists do is we just count the number of objects that, uh, or the mass, if you like. Something more fundamental linked to, for example, the atom. So it turns out that this atomic mass, for example, for carbon is 12-ish, gives us some information beyond just the mass of carbon. We arrive at this identity that a so-called mole, this, this number, is, which is this big number here, six something, right? is how many carbon atoms there are if you were holding its mass in grams. Let me give you, uh, how am I gonna go about that? I'll give you a different example of this. If hydrogen is, is mass is one, if I were to hold one gram of hydrogen in my hand, I'd be holding one mole of hydrogen atoms. I've just counted the number of atoms. The mole is nothing more than a number much the same as 100, 1,000, 1 million. It's just another name. It just happens to be for a number that isn't base 10. It's just this big number right here, okay? So this is useful because it's allowing us to then count based on mass the number of atoms that we have of a certain type. Okay, so in 2014, the water industry, for, certainly for coffee, uh, was talking about everything in milligrams per liter. And hopefully you can see then that if I'm counting something by mass in milligrams, then you'd you sure better hope that you know the identity of the thing you're counting. Otherwise, you have no idea whether you've got, you know, let's say I, I've got 100 million of something really light or I've got one thing of something really heavy. Much the same as that elevator example. If I told you that the elevator collapsed and fell to the ground, was it because there was too many people or was it because we tried to move the elephant, right? So let's compare the example here for magnesium. Magnesium's mass is much, much lighter than calcium. Okay, so for every single magnesium, you could almost have two magnesium ions in one hand for every calcium you'd have in the other one. And they, that's pretty crazy, right? So let me just distill this for you, that if I had a water containing 100 milligrams per liter of magnesium, that is actually 64% more concentrated with ions than 100 milligrams per liter of calcium. Okay, so the PPM measurement is problematic. Hopefully you can see this now, that 64% is like day and night, okay? So chemists get over this problem by just counting mole per liter, not mass per liter. And of course this is intractable if we're talking about something in reality like measuring the concentration of coffee stuff in water, right? You have to measure it with a, with a scale, you have to weigh it. So this is not what I recommend, of course, for people to do, but it's to illustrate that the origin of the problem that we're about to overcome was related to the fact we were measuring mass but not knowing what that mass was. Okay, so we then move on to equilibrium. For every reaction, for anything you do in life, there is a terminal uh, position, an extraction that you could achieve or uh, an extent to it that, which that reaction occurred. And so this may mean that I have a, a two starting materials, A and B, and I want them to react and they're gonna form something, product C. Well, equilibrium is gonna tell us how much of C is formed and how much of A and B were consumed along the way, okay? And so you can construct an equation that says, if I just measure the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the starting materials, that gives us the so-called equilibrium constant. And so for every reaction, we can do this. Now, some of these constants could be really small. So imagine if we don't form any product, right? Then this number is essentially zero. And so this whole side of this reaction is zero. So the small equilibrium constant means a reaction did not occur to some a great extent. And a really big number would mean that we've consumed most of our reagents, so this is becoming very small, and this is becoming large, and so therefore this fraction is getting large. Okay, so for an acid-base reaction, which is just the transfer of a hydrogen right here to a base, which is just a recipient of this hydrogen, you can imagine a reaction where this just hops over, and so we get this and this. And so actually if we look at the 
products divided by the reagents or the starting materials, this equation here is called the acid dissociation constant, Ka. Okay? So then we have to have some way of quantifying how strong an acid is. And it turns out that we are typically thinking of things solvated in water. And so if we treat water as the base, then you can transfer this hydrogen onto water. The resultant uh, products here are an, this compound missing an H+, plus, therefore it's a minus charge, and this guy here, hydronium. Now you'll note that this is now a minus charge, which means it could receive a hydrogen again. And so in fact, after you have an acid react with a base, they switch roles, and now all of a sudden the acid becomes the base, and the base becomes the acid. It's, it's crazy, right? It's, it's awesome. So you come up with this, this reaction here where you say, okay, how much of the base, the conjugate base did we form and how much of this H plus or hydronium is there in solution? And then how much do, of the acid did we start with? And you'll note that water is not here. And the reason water is not here is we just assume there's a ton of water. So the concentration of water doesn't change very much. So it's just a constant. So don't worry about it. Okay, so this, this Ka, this acid dissociation constant in water, is wh essentially what tells us how strong an acid is. Now the next thing that matters is that you might have a molecule that has lots of Ka's because it's got lots of acidic protons. So here is citric acid, and you could lose the first one, which comes off of this guy here. You could lose the second one, and you could lose the third one. And now the energy of losing each subsequent proton, it be becomes progressively more and more difficult to do so. And so typically molecules like this exist somewhere in either having lost one or two, okay? Once they, uh, or a graphical way of viewing what's happened here is essentially you have a, a molecule that's solvated in some water. Now usually I've got faint gray water molecules, but you'll have to imagine they're there. And uh, you have acetic acid, and it dissolves in water, and it's going to transfer this proton over to hydronium, and then hydronium is going to transfer that over to another water, and next thing you know, you've got acetate, and you've got hydronium, and they're separated, and they're floating around in solution. This is essentially what happens when you dissolve acids in water. Okay, so the final thing we need to put this all together is the, the letter P. So P as in PH or PKA or P the number of people in this room. P is a mathematical operation. It just means the negative logarithm base 10 of any number. Okay. So if I take PH, that is just simply the negative logarithm base 10 of the concentration of protons. So if I want to know the PH of something, all I'm really doing is I'm just measuring the concentration of protons. right? So the extent in which those acids had turned into H pluses. That's what PH is. So if I want to have a pKa, I could just have the Ka, which is that reaction where the proton is transferred into water, and I just take the negative log base 10 of that. And so you can probably see that the extent in which the proton is transferred into the water is pretty much going to directly determine the pH of the solution. So strong acids are going to result in pHs going down a lot. Weak acids result in the pH going down not as much. That's the, that's the conclusion, if you like, of this P. So I could take P of this room, right? It's just negative log base 10 of how many people are in here, and it will give me something, a number. Does it mean something? Probably not. But this is, you know, this is what we have to do to make these two things comparable. Every acid has a different pKa, which is an indication of how acidic it is. The more, ne the more small, including negative numbers, the pKa, the more acidic the compound is. So for example, if we take vinegar, its pKa is 4.8. This means that at pHs of around 4.8, vinegar is going to either act acidic or not. So if, I'm in the, if, if the water is already a pH of 4.7, then vinegar is not going to be acidic in water with a pH of 4.7. So acids act less acidic in acidic water, right? This is pretty cool. And then another thing you need to think about is that the pH scale, we typically say 0 to 14, but actually some acids are so acidic that they'll pro they will completely dissociate in water no matter what. So they have a pKa of minus 10. That means this thing's pretty acidic, okay? So here's our, here's our uh, pH scale. Humans like things on the acid side. Uh, in fact, stuff on the basic side, the reason we don't like this is because it neutralizes your stomach acid, right? So you have this pretty, pretty acidic inside your stomach, and that's to help chew up all the different organic bonds that you're ingesting as food. So milk sits somewhere around, I don't know, let's say pH of 6. Coffee is more or less like 4.9 to 5.1 pH, remarkably consistent. Uh, wine is far more acidic than this. In fact, in my uh, 
first year uh, of teaching, I got the students to titrate uh, a really bad wine that was too acidic back to a drinkable point, right? So these are the sorts of things that we do at the University of Oregon. Uh, so, <laughs> so then we've got citrus fruits and then stomach acid. And, and of course, I told you that you could go more negative. You could go down into the minus one, minus two. We just don't talk about it much because most things aren't in those regions. But actually, it turns out that water sort of brackets all of this. So on one, in the center at pH 7, we have water, which is neutral. But we also can have water becoming acidic. So in acidic solutions, water is H3O plus or hydronium. And as you go into basic solutions or alkaline, you end up with water losing a proton. It's been stripped of its proton. It becomes OH minus. So the reaction, you can imagine two water molecules. One transfers a hydrogen to the other one. The resultant product of that reaction is OH minus and H3O plus, right? That reaction has a Ka value. It's going to occur to some extent. And so if I heat water up, it's going to form more of the products. So two water molecules react and form more products. Now, remember that a pH measurement is a measurement of how much H plus or H3O plus is in solution. Sure, okay, I've had two water molecules, they react. They make an H3O plus and an OH minus. This water is still charge neutral. It is still pH neutral. But if all I do is measure the concentration of one of the, one of the products, you're going to see that it's increasing. And, and therefore, you're going to say, oh, as I heat water, the pH is dropping because all I'm doing is monitoring how many H pluses are in solution. And of course, that's increasing as I heat water. So one might conclude then that water is becoming more acidic in hot environments. But indeed, it's still neutral. Okay, So that's the first key thing. The next, next key thing is, is that as you cool water down, you shift back the other way. And so sometimes when you measure cool water's pH, you're going to see the pH is higher than 7. And that's because as you cool it down, you push the, you push the pH, uh, the concentration of protons back to the other side. Okay, so temperature, pH is temperature dependent. Okay, here we are. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, so we've got, the, the question is, uh, what, what does fluoride do when it's added to water? So it turns out that fluoride, most salts of fluoride, so if we think back to the periodic table that I showed you, fluoride is in the top right. Most salts of fluoride are actually not that soluble in water. So if they find a positive charge, they're going to crystallize and they end up somewhere, you know, in the, in the, in, you know as, a, as a solid. But what it does is just a small negative charge and floats around. The reason people to have had negative connotations with this is because calcium will crystallize with fluoride. And so in normal drinking water, if you have fluoride and calcium, it just crystallizes, right? But if you drink too much of it, you have calcium in your bones, and so you can start to crystallize calcium fluoride. So people were worried about this initially, but it turns out that the concentrations of fluoride in, in drinking water are extremely low, right? We're talking below 1.5 ppm in an extreme example. So it, Honestly, I mean, if you drank a real lot of it, it's probably not great for your bones, but in general, actually, fluoride, is, fluoride at low concentrations does, you know, it seems to have positive effects on, on forming uh, the outer layer of bone, uh, for example, in your teeth. Yeah. That's a great question, though. Do you have one? Uh, just regarding uh, pH changes regarding temperature. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so the, que the question is, what temperature should you test the pH of your water at? That, now, that's a good question. Uh, it, it turns out that you can map the, p the pH versus temperature of water. I don't have that graph here, and so for the next time I put this online, I should, this slide should have that. Um, it doesn't matter what temperature you measure at. You just need to know the temperature you're measuring at, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Let's power through. So if it wasn't complicated already, we're moving into the complex stuff now. Okay. And yeah, I'm on 48 minutes. About 40 minutes ago, you didn't know all this stuff, or some of you might have, but now, now we're really flying. So it turns out that in your body, your pH sits at around 7.25 to 7.45 always. If you go outside of this, you're in trouble. And the reason is, is that a lot of processes in your body rely on H plus being transferred around in your body somewhere. You need an H plus to go in and out of a cell. It's the way we signal things, the way we, our heart fires. You know, it's everything. So if you all of a sudden change outside, let's go 7.54, 7.55, whatever, now all of a sudden there's less protons flying around in your body 
and now you can't, you know, now your body's going to start shutting down because it's not firing, you know, their signals are not happening, you don't know to breathe, all sorts of stuff. Bad things happen. So you have to monitor, your, we've evolved to be this pH range. And so something has to keep us in there. Okay, and it turns out that these things are called buffers. And all they are is just a chemical reaction that prevents tremendous pH swings. A best example of this is bicarbonate. Now the way it got in the water in the first place is that CO2 that we said was not that soluble, well it turns out it's not so bad, right? It reacts with water to form carbonic acid, and this thing is quite acidic. So now it's going to lose one of its protons and become bicarbonate, and that proton floats off and goes somewhere, okay? So we have a bunch of bicarb in our body. If all of a sudden I ingest a bunch of acid, a source of H+, then bicarb reacts with it instead of water. And bicarb goes this way, forming carbonic acid, which decomposes, and then you exhale. Okay, so then you're fine. And then if you go this way, and you ingest a whole bunch of base, bicarbonate deals with that, and you've got formed carbonate, and you've got a bunch of calcium in your body, and you end up forming lime scale. Now, this can happen in your kidneys, this can happen in your bones. You don't want to go this way, right? This is not where you want to be. <laughs> so... That's maybe, I don't know, maybe we just like acids because otherwise we just turn into a rock. I don't know. But the, the, the point is, is that this thing here monitors pH changes. And this is the elegant process in which it does that. This is some magical uh, humanoid thing floating above, and there's this magic cup of coffee. This was, this was our first embodiment of explaining a buffer. But I actually have learned since then, and I think that we shouldn't shy away from the details. So here we are. We're going to go into it. So... Because bicarbonate uh, tries to reduce pH swings, and coffee is sitting on the acidic side of the spectrum in water, you can imagine then that bicarbonate is going to interact with coffee. And so if coffee's at a pH of, let's say, 5, to make the discussion simple, then bicarbonate is certainly going to react, and the, hydrogen, uh, the protons in coffee molecules are going to be transferred to bicarbonate. And so as this happens, you can imagine then all of a sudden that acid is no longer acidic in that solution. Right? That's, that's the role of bicarbonate, is to make sure those acids disappear. They're no longer acidic. And so if you have too much of a bicarbonate concentration, then it's going to deal with all of the acids that you've tried to introduce to that liquid. It will completely buffer them away. You won't be able to perceive them. In fact, you might perceive them negatively. Because an acid tastes, as we know from the score sheet, acidic and sweet and has all these positive characteristics. And conjugate bases, or alkaline compounds, taste often like fish. They taste kind of bitter, they taste, uh, yeah, fishy is probably the best description. And so if you, have, if you have too much, you end up with that weird conjugate base flavor, and if you have too little, then you get this super bright, powerful acidity in coffee. But this is true actually in just in general. So people in beer have known this for a, in a very, very long time, okay? So I'm not, I'm in some sense just sort of repurposing the wheel. Okay, so we know that bicarbonate's job then is to structure the flavors of acids or to prevent pH swings. But for every minus, you have to have a plus. And so if we then think about um, making molecules from things that were negatively charged on this side, we have to have counter ions that are positive. So it must be these guys over here. And they also, they're not benign. They do something in water chemistry as well. So the way I thought of it initially was that if I had some coffee thing, with some sort of dingly bit that had oxygen hanging out of it, I'd have calcium fly by and it's positively charged and the oxygen's negatively charged and they sort of stick together and it'd pull, oh look at that, we've got this molecules come out into water and calcium's helped facilitate this. And indeed, this is more or less the conclusion that we came to uh, in our original publication. However, we since now know that it's not really an explicit interaction as I've drawn here, or maybe I've got it here, yeah. So it's not an explicit interaction per se where calcium, which is surrounded by water, will bind to the, you know, to the oxygen atoms that are on some scaffold of an organic compound. In this case, this is theoflavin, a compound that we've found in Ethiopian washed coffees. So we know that as, as we had harder water, we'd be able to perceive more of these theoflavin-derived flavors, black tea flavors, things that we like in Ethiopian coffee. But as it turns out, it's probably not because of an explicit interaction, but rather just making the water in general more polar. So as there's more calcium in there, there's more positive charge, the water's more polarized, and we just end up extracting more polar things into the water, okay? Conversely, 
you might note if you use hard water to brew something like tea, so alpha pinine is, uh, pinene excuse me, is one of the main compounds in chamomile tea, this, uh, you, if you had hard water, the really polar hard water is going to exclude compounds that are not that polarized. And so compounds like this are really not going to end up in appreciable concentrations, much the same as that oil and water separation idea that we talked about earlier. So this is problematic because I'm telling you that coffee has molecules that look like this and tea has molecules that look like this, and you need water like that for coffee and water like not that for tea. Okay. <laughs> All right, who cares about tea? All right, so, <laughs> so <laughs> the problem is, is that, this, uh, that calcium, calcium is great, right? Calcium helps charge up that water, but the issue with calcium is that it will form lime scale with carbonate. And so this is a, a La Marzacco strata being destroyed by uh, somebody who, th these are all people that used to work at Kelowna and Smalls, at least, you know, picture, character, caricatures of them, whatever. Uh, here is magnesium. He's also equally charged as calcium, but in this case, you can see these magical flavors that have been pulled out uh, without destroying an espresso machine. So, you can probably see where we're going with this. You want magnesium in there if you're worried about the lime scale. You want to control the bicarb concentration so that you have an idea of how much acidity is going to be uh, perceivable in your cup of coffee. And so then you might need to know what's in your water. And so now we need to go back to thinking like a chemist again, right? So I need to count. So in 2014, this is the device, the ionic conductivity probe. It's a TDS, or total dissolved solids measurement. And the idea here is you have two electrodes spatially separated like this. And if I turn one as positive and one as negative by passing electricity between them, then positively charged ions, for example, sodium, will migrate towards the negatively charged electrode. And then the positively charged electrode will have the negatively charged ions migrating towards it. This is uh, the way that you quantify how much stuff is solvated is simply by how much charge is moving. In other words, you can think of it as a resistivity measurement. Um, this is great if you know what's in your water because then you'll know which ions are moving in which direction and then you're good to go. But the problem is, is that every ion moves at a different speed or carries a different amount of charge. Hydrogen, H+, plus, a proton, is very small and charge dense. And so it really conducts. So you can see 350. Now compare that to sodium, Na+, plus, just right below it on the periodic table. Look at that. It's, it's like seven times less conductive. So if I had salt water or just slightly acidic water, they might read the same on an ionic conductivity probe TDS measurement. So in other words, I wouldn't even be able to tell you between... A, whether I was dealing with a cup of salt water or a cup of just a slightly acidic water with this device. I was met in 2014 with tremendous pushback. Uh, and so I challenged the, the ringleader of all of this to a cupping where I got to make the water, one of them of three cups, a triangulation, where one of them contained uranium dioxide. Uh, obviously this is, I can't buy this, it's, it's, it's uh, banned. Um, <laughs> but this proved the point. Uh, you should never ingest this, and of course we would never actually drink this, but the point is, is that you would not be able to tell with this device whether your cup was filled with uranium dioxide, okay? This is a problem. So if you can't even tell whether it's salt water or not, or it's filled with something that might kill you, the device is probably not helping us too much, unless we already knew what was in the water in the first place, or if the measurement showed a very small number. Because a small number would indicate there's not much stuff in your water, okay? So either you've got soft water with this device, or you don't know, and you're going to have to do more work, okay? You could titrate. Now, a titration is a simple measurement where you start with a known quantity of water or some analyte. You then add something that's known, and at some point you get a color change, and based on the amount of stuff you added, you can back out what you've got in that solution. This is the reaction that occurs. EDTA, this compound here, is used for heavy metal poisoning. So if you ingested lead, you're going to be given EDTA. And what it does is acts like a glove. It finds metals, positively charged things, and binds them irreversibly, almost irreversibly. Now, you just essentially keep adding a known amount of this to an unknown amount of calcium, and at some point, all the calcium is bound up, and that's it. Now, you've got, now you know how much calcium is in, this, in the solution. It would be great if you had a way of selectively binding calcium, but you still wouldn't be able to, with this titration, monitor whether it was lead or calcium. So you've now quantified cations, but you haven't quantified what they are. 
There is, a, there is this product on the market that does di uh, differentiate between magnesium and calcium. So this is pretty neat. And the reason this exists is because apparently corals require a very precise amount of calcium solvated in water to be uh, growing and, and lush and so forth. So, so this, if you are interested in doing titrations, I have a YouTube video of me doing this. This is the most boring video in the entire world. And it's been viewed a lot. So... <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I teach the first-year chemists, I always point to this and say, trust me, it's important, okay? So another way you could quantify exactly what's in solution from a metal perspective is you could make an, a filament of a light bulb of, let's say, calcium. You then heat it up, and it shines calcium light. This is not foreign, right? Outside, they, so those yellow lamps at nighttime, they're made of sodium, so it's a sodium lamp. So if I want to quantify calcium, I make a filament of calcium. I then pump in a solution that contains calcium, and the calcium in the solution will ab absorb the calcium light from calcium. And based on the amount of calcium light it absorbs, that's how much calcium we've got. So this works well for positively charged things, but it doesn't work well for molecules. I can't make a filament out of bicarbonate, okay? So we still haven't solved that problem. Okay, so the bicarbonate actually can be done by a titration, and that one works really well. So you don't even need to do anything crazy, it's just a pH titration, because bicarbonate's role is just monitoring pH. So everyone's done this, well, not everyone, but most of you have probably seen this before. I'm sure we have a kit here if, if you haven't seen one. So here we are. Finally, we are getting to the, the part uh, that actually matters for coffee. Uh, do we have any questions at this point? Yeah. Oh yeah, good question. Sorry, uh, here. So <coughs> semen is uh, the SI unit for, oh boy. Hold on. I, uh, is the SI unit for conductivity? No, Siemens per centimeter is uh, the conductivity unit. And I guess that's reciprocal for resistivity. So I, I need to think about that, what that actually means physically. But it's, uh, it's a measurement of charge per, uh, per area per how many of those charges exist in solution. Let me get back to you on semen. Yeah. Anything else on this? Or does anyone know the answer more analytically than that? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> good. All right. Hey, let's talk about water quality real quick. We're like almost halfway through. So here we are. So uh, I've traveled a lot of places and tasted water in lots of places. And the ionic conductivity probe has showed me that in certain locations we have soft water. And sure, I can use it to quantify soft water. But that's way, way, way easier than quantifying what's in the hard water. And so you can imagine in places like London, which is extremely hard, it's quite important to be able to communicate what's in your water so that you can tell someone else what to expect when they brew it in really soft water, for example. Okay, so I'm trying to elect uh, to um, install some sort of water filtration apparatus in my cafe. And the first thing I might do is titrate and figure out all the stuff that's in my water. I could send it off to some water surveying uh, company and they'd tell you everything you need to know. And then they come back and perhaps a sales representative will try and sell you a variety of products ranging from simple carbon filtration all the way to a reverse osmosis unit with a huge tank. Okay, these are all options, but picking the right option, at least in 2014, was, uh, it was sort of a, an enigma because we, didn't, we weren't empowered with knowledge of what we needed to do to our water. So hopefully by the end of this you will be. All carbon-based filtration more or less comes from roasted coconuts. So. If you go and see people advertising that, oh, this is an organic-derived carbon, they all are organic-derived carbon because we have no use for coconut shells, right? So we like the coconut on the inside, and we roast the crap out of it, and we get this stuff. And it turns out that this stuff will bind all those organic molecules that were not that soluble in water. So carbon filtration is used to remove organic compounds from water, things that are not that soluble. Things that are soluble, like calcium, lithium, magnesium, bicarbonate, they don't, they don't interact with this at all. Okay, so this is purely to remove, as the sales reps might tell you, like taste and odor, you know, odor and whatever, smell, I don't know, I don't know what they say anymore. Point is, is that you put this most of the time on the front end of your water filtration to strip out anything that might have made its way in, in the pipes on the way to your cafe or, or your home. A Brita filter, for example, contains some of this, okay? Uh, then there's another type of resin, which is a little bead, and these beads have acids and bases on the surface of them. Now, if you load up the acid with a, a variety of different metals, like, for example, calcium or magnesium on the surface, and then you pass in some water that contains different metals, you're going to have the water exchange onto the surface like this, 
and then you're going to have the stuff that was on the surface end up in the water. This is pretty simple. You get one plus on the surface, trading in for one plus in the liquid. They switch. Okay? You can't do anything more than switch. Okay? So this is, this is the basis for this so-called like magnesium exchange resin, is it really is exchanging magnesium into the water. But there has to be stuff in the water in the first place, otherwise you can't exchange. The next thing you could do is have protons on the surface. They'll react with bicarbonate to form uh, carbonic acid. This then, as I told you, will de decompose into uh, CO2 and water. So having a, a pH buffered resin allows you to remove the bicarbonate concentration from your water. You may not want to do either of those. Perhaps your water is in a perfect ratio that you like, but you just need to lower it linearly so the calcium comes down and the bicarb comes down. You then need to invoke osmosis, or more specifically reverse osmosis, where osmosis is that this side is less concentrated of black dots and this side is more concentrated. Osmotically, they're going to equilibrate so that they're equally concentrated on both sides. And so over time, osmotically, you'll see the volume down here decrease, concentrating this, and the volume up here increasing, and then they, eat, they become the same. Reverse osmosis goes the other way. You just use energy to push the water through and leave all the ions on one side. One example might be a couple of carbon filters to remove those organic molecules and then this RO membrane, and you just force water through it and water comes out and the ions go somewhere else. Cafes sometimes uh, dispose of these in their toilets. They use them as the toilet water. Sometimes they use them uh, for nothing, you know, but typically this is really hard water, so you don't want to put it in any equipment. And then you might blend a little bit of this back in or perhaps you take some of your starting water and blend that back in, okay? But all that does is allow us to linearly lower the concentration. Okay, so yeah, so what are we trying to achieve? So <coughs> this is the new graph for Water for Coffee 2, which overcomes an, uh, some ambiguity in the first version. So in the first version, we were talking about milligrams per liter, but I've just told you that we should do it in mole per liter. But fortunately, you can convert mole per liter to milligram per liter. So I've done the hard part for you, okay? The story hasn't changed much. Essentially, you don't want to have too little bicarbonate because your coffee gets acidic, but you don't want to have too much because then you can't taste anything. And similarly, you don't want to have too little of this positive charges in the solution because you won't have enough polarity and you'll start to extract ashy flavors and sort of these things that we don't like. But if you have too much, then you start to get cellulose and really strange big organic compounds that should never end up in, in the first place. So you end up with something that looks like this. And then inside that, there's some ideal zone. And now this is totally empirical based on uh, drinking a lot of coffee and working with uh, essentially every, all of you to understand where we like our coffee to be brewed in. Okay. The problem is, however, is that as the calcium concentration increases, the bicarb typically would too, and they form lime scale. And so I'm telling you we want hard water, but we don't want bicarbonate, and that's difficult to achieve. So machine manufacturers don't like it, because calcium goes up, so does bicarb, and the next thing you know, you form lime scale. Both of these are different types of lime scale, but the summary is that this is a solid that can end up depositing on temperature probes, it can clog small... Uh, uh, channels in the espresso machine, you know, all sorts of problems, okay? Uh, mass uh, heat transfer gets diminished and so forth. If you had Cl minus in solution, uh, well, chloride actually catalytically uh, promotes the decomposition of iron. So if you initially had stainless steel, then you have Cl minus in there, then all of a sudden you're going to start d dissolving your stainless steel. So this is a problem too. So you can't have HCO3 minus, you can't have Cl minus, you're in a bit of a pickle. Okay, so the summary here is then at, at this point, I guess we have maybe, uh, I don't know, like five or six, so more slides until we take a, a, oh no, we have way more than that. All right, so the summary is that. So what's best? Well, it just depends on your starting water. I don't want to go into this because you will, you will actually have an opportunity to review these slides online. So it's just going to depend on what you start with. You're going to need to titrate. The Romans, this is the water from Bath. So the Romans were coming here uh, in the year three and drinking this water. And you'll note here that a chemist didn't write this because this should be calcium 2 plus, Cl minus, Na plus, etc. But the most um, ubiquitous anion in solution is SO4, 2 minus, sulfate. Now sulfate we typically think of as kind of a weird anion, right? I don't mention it much. Because actually the World Health Organization states that it needs to be lower than 250. And the reason is, is that the sulfate, sulfate, you have to have a lot of water around it. And so it doesn't go into your body, it stays in your intestines. And then the water flows from your body into your intestines. And when you have water in your, in your intestines, you then get diarrhea and then you know what happens. So at some point, you, you can't drink too much of this. But this is what the Romans were drinking. Maybe they liked that, I don't know. But the, <laughs> the point is, is that because we have a high concentration of sulfate, 
you could just linearly reduce all of this stuff in this water and get your, uh, get your concentrations into an appropriate region so it wouldn't cause any problems in a machine, and yet you still had the sulfate in water to balance out the calcium. So you could have really hard water, but it wasn't full of stuff we didn't want. Right? And so this is what was happening in Bath. So <laughs> you could do RO, and RO will just linearly take you down in concentration of calcium and bicarb and everything else for that matter. You could do an ion exchange. But remember, if I exchange calcium for magnesium, and then I do a mass measurement, you're going to say, hey, wait, it didn't just exchange because, of course, the TDS has gone down. But remember, if you substitute magnesium in for calcium, the mass has gone down because magne magnesium weighs less. Okay, <clears throat> so it turns out, though, that roasters are really good at this. They can roast within this whole spectrum. You can roast coffee differently just so that it tastes good in your, your particular roast water. The origin of the problem that Maxwell and I were having was that uh, one roaster had sent us coffee that was roasted for a certain type of water that had been RO'd, and so it didn't have that much acidity. And Maxwell had a little bit more bicarb in there, and so when he brewed that coffee with his water, it wiped out all of the acidity and tasted like fish oil. And that's a problem. So that, that was the discussion that we sort of inevitably arrived at was, was based on this. Okay, we need to have one more comment. Uh, so. Uh, Riemann cartridges are um, a little complicated because if you want to have a reverse osmosis water and then you want to add stuff back in, one thing you might do is flow water over calcite or calcium carbonate. But you see, actually, this is pretty unusual. So as temperature goes up, for most salts, they dissolve more in water. But if we zoom in on calcium carbonate, as temperature goes up, the solubility of calcium carbonate goes down. This is bad news for this guy. Right, because it's a hot water boiler, so it's going to crystallize calcium carbonate. But this is also bad news for you during, uh, you know, a normal day, where at the beginning of the day it might be 15 degrees in the in the shop, and at the end of the day it might be 30 degrees. And the difference in solubility of calcite between those two points is huge. So it's really difficult to remin. Okay. I want to share with you <coughs> a comment that I received uh, in an email from Susie, who who tells me, as you can read here, that she's no scientist, but she's thrilled that someone is backing up her th recent thoughts. And that in Melbourne, it's supposed to have the best coffee in the world, and also ha she likes sage tea. So I like the logical fallacies in this, because, you know, big steps between this. But um, she goes on to tell me a story here that in Jordan, she had some sage tea, and it tasted disgusting, but immediately after drinking it, she shit herself. So <laughs> she then bought the sage in Israel and brewed it in Israel and in Melbourne, but she couldn't get it to make that happen again, until she went to Port Ferry and brewed it, and then she shit herself again. <laughs> there is, I, I, sh I don't share this for any other reason. So let's move on. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, okay, so here we are. We're, we're about to get to the intermission. I want to share with you the, then the, the correlation, the, the, the relationship to the SCA. That coffee is a complicated mixture of organic molecules. In fact, here is about a quarter of them as of uh, when I looked at the papers from 1968. This is curated from just what they smelled on the top of the, top of the coffee, not even inside. It was a lot. Okay. So you get the idea that coffee's complicated, and then I went through and mapped out on the flavor wheel all of the PKAs, how acidic each compound is, that gives rise to the flavors in the organic products. Now, I was talking earlier to Ann about this, that it would be awesome if peach in a peach corresponded molecularly to a peach flavor in a coffee, okay? Maybe, maybe that's true, maybe not, but that's the best I've got, okay? But I can also then say, well, as carbonate concentration, go, bicarb concentration goes up, these are the panels that get wiped out. I mean, this is devastating for specialty coffee, right? That, that's terrible. So, if you compare it, uh, there's very few specialty coffees that have flavor notes only in this region. Uh, and this is the power of bicarbonate. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of take-home messages at this junction, our, our juncture are the, that there are certain coffees that do have these flavor notes. And typically, we don't think of these as the most valuable in the industry because they're low in perceived acidity. They don't have all of the characteristics that score high in the cupping sheet. But those are coffees from Hawaii, Sumatra, Brazil, uh, Vietnam, the ones that we typically 
don't, you won't see people competing with them, right? But actually, I would contend these are the most valuable because these are the coffees that I will sell or give to a family member who's going hiking to say that I work in specialty coffee and that it is different. And then no matter what water and no matter how bad they butcher this brew, it's still going to have flavor notes of dark chocolate, hazelnuts, and almonds. And they're going to go, that is great. Okay? <laughs> so those coffees that we typically look down upon are, are actually... I mean, from a specialty perspective, are actually some of the most valuable in the industry. Um, building water from, I don't know what happened there, but building water from scratch doesn't, it, we don't have technology to do it at the moment, okay? We're working on it. <clears throat> and finally, um, should you RO things? Well, I mean, RO will always take you down to soft. So if you want to homogenize that flavor profile and have coffee uh, in a cafe in Montreal and a cafe in Toronto taste the same, then sure, RO it. it you'll just have a lighter body, a lower extraction, you'll have really high acidity, and that's what you're going to get. <coughs> One final thought I added this slide while sitting on the little table over there is that imagine an extraction at 20% where you have 20 grams of coffee, you end up with 4 grams of solvated coffee stuff in water. Okay, and then I make an espresso with that exact same extraction, and it's got 40 mils of water. And then I compare it to a filter made with 400 mils of water. I have the exact same extraction, so imagine you have exactly the same compounds in the cup, just one's more concentrated than the other one. The coffee on the left has two milligrams of bicarbonate for, you know, for this given water, whatever, two milligrams of bicarb, and the coffee on the right has 20 milligrams of bicarb. In other words, if I use a, the same brew water for espresso versus filter, the espresso is going to taste more acidic, and it's not because of the concentration of the acids in there. It's because you've got 10 times less buffer. So if you are in a really hard water location, the best thing you could possibly do is use very little water, and so the best thing you could possibly brew is espresso. But it's also the worst thing you could possibly do to an espresso machine. So we're in a pickle. <laughs> so... Going back to what we thought about at the beginning, uh, we know that we want these dissolved metals because it makes the water more polar and gets the good flavors out of the coffee. We don't want to have too much bicarb because the bicarb is going to overstructure the flavor or just completely destroy the acids. Chloride is going to destroy the machine and sulfate is going to make you shit yourself, so you're in trouble. So. I don't have much more to say about the water stuff than that. I mean, this is, this is, the, pro this is the predicament we're in. This is, the this is the coffee industry. The point is, is that this is a discussion. So if I present to you a, a, a washed Ethiopian coffee that's supposed to taste like, uh, you know, lemon peel, uh, black tea, and peach, or stone fruit, or whatever, and then you don't taste that, there's a good chance it's not you, and it's not the coffee's fault. It's just a minor fluctuation in bicarbonate that's wiped out those flavors that you care about. You could go through and make your own waters if you wanted to try this. Um, or if you want to wipe out the flavor and just know what your coffee tastes like in hard water, just buy Evian. Evian is uh, extremely hard, so you can try that, and it's terrible. Um, so with that, it is time for a brief intermission. I assure you the second half is much shorter. Uh, and uh, I'll t happily take any questions. It's my pleasure to give you the first part here. Thank you. Thank you.